Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? If so, BetterHelp Online Counseling is there to, well, help. BetterHelp's mission is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient so anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. It's so important that we detach any stigma from asking for help. If you are in need of help, BetterHelp is a great option. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can get help in your own time and at your own pace. You can also schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat or text with your therapist. Ratchet and respectable listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code RATCHET. So why not get started today? Go to BetterHelp.com slash RATCHET. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ratchet. If you have a little bit of extra time on your hands or you're willing to make time, may I make a recommendation? Skillshare. Skillshare offers creative classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions. My favorite Skillshare class right now is Creative Breakthrough, eight exercises to power your creativity, confidence, and career, taught by Danielle Kreisa. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity and get two free months of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. That's two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started and join today by heading to Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. That's two free months of unlimited access to thousands of classes at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. Two things. I know I told you there wasn't going to be a podcast this week. But I'm pulling it off a couple days late, but here, nonetheless, thank you for your patience. Also, I apologize in advance for the sound. Last week, we talked about me moving to a new loft, and that happened. It was an exhausting move for the last two days. I've taken off all my clothes at the end of the day and just fallen into the bed and just completely knocked out. However, this move happened. My apartment is still full of boxes. I have not put my rugs down or bought new rugs or had a chance to buy new rugs. So the sound of the podcast is a little off right now. So I apologize if the audio is not right. I really wanted to take this week off, but there's so much happening that at least needs to be mentioned. And I didn't want to hold it till next week because news moves so fast right now. You miss a week, you miss a lot. I do have an interview this episode with a friend who's been keeping me up to date. I'm recording this on Friday morning. We did the interview on Tuesday, and it almost feels like the things we talked about were a month ago. But he and I had a really good conversation about Jada and Will. We talked about The Real and Tamara leaving and who we'd like to see added to that cast, assuming the show is still running. There were a couple other topics. When John Murray, that's the interview. He's a very good friend, and when we get together, we just, we just talk like old friends. It's almost like the recorder isn't on. We're very candid. We meander into different conversations, and we just have a great time. But before we get to that, I just wanted to run through, kind of quickly, all the stuff that's happened literally since Tuesday. I was up to date on Tuesday. As of Friday, I, what? There's some of what in a good way and some of what in a what-the-fuck way. Let's start with the good news. Viola Davis is on the cover of Vanity Fair looking amazing. She's got a big afro. She's got her back out. She's got on blue. It's a dark lighting, but lit well nonetheless. And it was shot by Dario Calmese. I'm butchering his name. I 
read his name. I haven't heard it. But Daria, he is the first black photographer that Vanity Fair has ever used on the cover in its 35 year history, which is crazy to me. All this amazing black talent and 35 years and you've never tapped any of it for your cover? That's your loss. Black folk bring their black culture, they bring all of their blackness to the table. And I mention that because Viola's pose on the Vanity Fair cover is very unique and it is paying homage to a very, I don't know if it's infamous, it's famous, but there was a photograph of an enslaved man who escaped. I think the story is he got to the Union Army and the image is of his back. If you remember in, in Belo- is it Beloved? The Toni Morrison novel? A woman is whipped and her back is described as looking like a choke cherry tree. She has been whipped so hard and so often that her back has welped up in permanent scars. And that is what Gordon's back looked like. That's what Viola and Dario were channeling for this image. It's a beautiful photo, but then knowing the context of it made it even more striking for me. It's a good article, great read. Viola is a very well-read, thoughtful, engaged person. The quote that's getting all the attention in the press is how she said that she wishes she didn't do the help and she felt like she, quote, betrayed my people. She said she only took the role because she wanted her career to, quote, and unquote, pop. And she did. She got an Oscar nod for Best Supporting Actress for her role, Annalise. Is that her name in the film? No, Annalise Keating is from the show. I don't remember her name in the help. Continue. I think this might be a case of Viola being too hard on herself. I mean, the help was in many ways, a very problematic film, but I think Viola brought humanity to the character that she played. Um, You know, she's playing a maid for white folks. That is the story of some of our great grandmothers, grandmothers, maybe even mothers. There is no shame in legal, honest work. If you got to clean folks' toilets to to feed your family, then that's what you have to do. I, I liked and disliked the film for different reasons, but I thought Viola brought dignity to her character and I don't think she has anything to be ashamed of but she does think that I thought that she as per usual brought great acting and depth to the table so kudos to Viola on her Vanity Fair cover and a really great interview Nick Cannon is back in the news he has been fired not just from MTV but Viacom as a whole Viacom is the parent company to BET and also CBS other properties as well. But Nick Cannon has been fired from from all Viacom properties over a podcast interview he did with Professor Griff, formerly of Public Enemy, who was kicked out of the group, I want to say back in the late 80s, early 90s. I remember as a kid when he was fired, but Nick Cannon interviewed him. He made some comments that were deemed anti-Semitic. I have not had the time to go listen to the interview for myself. Friends whose opinions that I trust very much described it as shit you say in barbershops, but never in front of a microphone. Surely I'm not the only woman who's had a Caesar before and has spent some time sitting in barbershops. There's always one, usually the barber, that usually has conspiracy theories about the black man being held back and who's at fault for the black condition. And sometimes they say things that are a little... um off color or blatantly racist, but people whose opinion I trust listened to the show and they were like, he either sounded like the barber or he sounded like, do you remember in Living Color, the Damon Wayne sketch where he was in prison and he was just using like a bunch of big words? They were like, that's what Nick Cannon sound like. And I was like, oh dear. But he did this interview and Viacom announced that they were kicking him out. And Nick Cannon's first reaction was, while and now is a billion dollar brand and I want full ownership of, of the thing that I built. Who in their right mind is going to give away a billion dollar brand? Stop it. I really thought Nick Cannon owned while and out. I really did. Um, turns out he does not. Because when I first heard it and I was like, oh, you know, he said these things, but he's not going to be put on total pause because he owns while and out and it's a you know, a popular brand. And then I found out he didn't own it. And I was like, bruh, you can't be out here talking reckless like that when you don't own your shit. At some point, we're going to have to have a, um, a more in-depth discussion about Minister Farrakhan and how black folks feel about him. Because it seems anytime 
a public black person brings up Minister Farrakhan or is affiliated with Minister Farrakhan, they are immediately canceled. Black folks tend to like Farrakhan, though. Not because of the anti-Semitism, despite it. We're going to have a deeper discussion about that. He drives white people crazy. And it's kind of fun to watch. He's like the only national black leader we've had that didn't get killed. That's part of the appeal. One of the reasons that Minister Farrakhan is able to thrive in some respects is because he owns his own shit. He's the face of the Nation of Islam. I imagine that's who supports him. That's how his bills are paid. But it allows him to speak freely. When you are working for other people and other people own your shit, you can't speak the way that you can speak when you own your shit. Nick Cannon has been in the game for a very long time. He should know that by now. But after doubling down on what he said and demanding that Viacom give him while and out, he did have a change of heart. Somebody spoke to him, but he came back and said, I'm deeply apologetic and I shouldn't have. I'm ashamed of my actions, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Nick, you didn't see Steven Jackson and Deshaun Jackson go through this literally last week. I feel like literally last week I was having this exact same conversation about two different people. Deshaun Jackson from the NFL, he posted some anti-Semitic stuff and people were all up in arms with good reason. And then Steven Jackson decided to jump in the fray in defense of Deshaun, why I will never understand, and then took a beating more brutal than Deshaun. Deshaun was apologizing while Steven was out there still saying crazy shit on CNN, talking to Don, not making any sense. Nick knew better. He's been in the game long enough where he knows, like, anti-Semitism, homophobia, those are the two fastest ways to get canceled. I want to know what their secret is, because people be out here talking reckless about and to black folks. I want black folks to be able to cancel folks the same way the Jewish folk and the LGBTQIA folk. I want black folks to be able to instantly cancel people the way that they do. Power is sexy. Let's work on that as a community. In Nick's favor, he pulled himself together fast enough that Fox will not be canceling him. So he still has his job on The Masked Singer for now. I like Nick Cannon. I think that... This is not his first time being in the middle of some controversy. If I recall, 2016, he told people not to vote, which, bruh. I think he's misguided occasionally, but well-intentioned. Hopefully, he will pull himself together after this incident. I don't want to see him lose his career. Meg the Stallion got shot by Tory Lanez. Is that his name? I don't know this man. I know Meg. But apparently he shot Meg in the foot. It seems to be a domestic violence incident. I'm not sure. Information is still coming out. So let's table that for next week when we have more information. My prayers are with Megan. My prayers are also with the family of Naya Rivera. She went missing on July 8th while she was boating with her four-year-old son. Authorities found the son alone in the boat in the middle of the lake. Naya was nowhere to be found. They assumed that she was deceased. There's heartbreaking photos of her father. Oh God, I'm getting choked up. Her father swimming in the lake, trying to find her body. Parents love, my God, dead or alive, he's going to find his child. Her mother was standing on the pier and appeared to be praying. Her cast also went down to the lake and they held hands and spoke her name. That poor kid may or may not have seen his mom die. God, I'm wiping my eyes. That's such a sad story. Her body was recovered. The autopsy came out a couple days ago. Her cause of death was drowning and the manner of death is an accident, which is, you know, what everyone suspected. But may she rest in peace and my prayers are with her family. I'm in the middle of this big move. It's driving me nuts, but I'm trying to focus on the end result. Waking up, no alarm, natural light, and crisp white sheets. So many of my friends have Brooklyn and sheets. They swear by them. So I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I just ordered them the other day. They haven't arrived yet. I went with the classic. They're supposed to transform your whole bed into, quote, the cool side of the pillow. I get very hot in the middle of the night, so this is perfect for me. 
If you're not familiar with Brooklinen, they have a variety of sheets, colors, patterns, and materials for all your lounging needs. Brooklinen sheets are the perfect place to start making your mornings great. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their bedding comes with a lifetime warranty. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code RATCHET only at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? If so, BetterHelp Online Counseling is there to, well, help. BetterHelp's mission is to make professional counseling accessible, affordable, and convenient so anyone who struggles with life's challenges can get help anytime, anywhere. It's so important that we detach any stigma from asking for help. If you are in need of help, BetterHelp is a great option. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. You can get help in your own time and at your own pace. You can also schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat or text with your therapist. BetterHelp's licensed professional counselors specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, and more. And anything you share is confidential. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Ratchet and respectable listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code RATCHET. So why not get started today? Go to BetterHelp.com slash Ratchet. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ratchet. Also this week, people just stop giving a fuck. This is the week that like everyone just snapped. It's always interesting to me, like the things that push people over the edge. Like it's rarely like a big blow up type thing. It's the smallest thing, the strangest thing when people are like, fuck this shit and just flip out. The governor of Georgia, who, if you recall, I want to say sometime in April, everybody else had closed by like mid-March. He was like, oh yeah, I didn't know that asymptomatic people could spread the virus. We'll close Georgia now. The CDC is in your backyard. You didn't know, but I knew. I just knew because I watched the news all day. And I listened to scientists and doctors tell me, hey, asymptomatic people can spread the virus. But you didn't know. The governor. Okay. Georgia reopened early, even when Trump, who was like, oh, we have to reopen the economy. He was like, nah, Georgia, like y'all doing the most. Like, you know, I want it open, but not like this. Georgia governor goes full speed ahead. Despite Georgia's surge right now, he refuses to mandate masks for the entire state. Black folk being more susceptible to COVID and for whatever reason, just refusing to wear masks. Atlanta has been wilding. I'm sure other places do too, but Atlanta has the misfortune of wanting to document a lot of their stupidity. There was some, I don't know what to call it, an event. Somebody was doing donuts in the middle of the street and it was like hundreds of people all packed together with no mask on. We talked about the pool party at Compound, which is a bad idea in a non-pandemic, which is a death wish in one. But Mayor Keisha was like, yo, y'all are doing the goddamn most. I can't force you to stay inside, but I can force you to put on a goddamn mask. Do you know the governor of Georgia is suing the mayor of Atlanta because she's trying to force people to wear masks? It infringes on their freedoms. I'm like, what freedom? The right to die? Of all the things you got going on in the middle of a global pandemic, you got time to sue the mayor for trying to force people to protect themselves. It's like trying to force people to wear seatbelts. Why y'all don't want to live? Why? Speaking of mayors, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, she's been ran out of fucks. The White House press secretary, she referred to Mayor Lightfoot as the derelict mayor of Chicago. And Mayor Lightfoot had a, a quick clap back. She said, Karen... The woman's name is Kylie, by the way. She said, hey, Karen, watch your mouth. I don't know why people keep wanting to try her. The woman does not give a fuck. Remember she told the guys who were going to play basketball, she was like, your jump shot is always going to be weak. Stay home. No fucks. No fucks. Chris Cuomo is also out of fucks. The head of Goya does an appearance at the White House and he praises President Trump. And as a result, people started calling for a boycott of Goya products. And I'm mad at that man because them Goya black beans are good. I don't know how to make beans. 
So this man is messing up dinner. But I agree with the boycott. But people call for a boycott. And Ivanka Trump, the little blonde one, she posts on social media holding up a can of Goya beans. I was like, isn't this some sort of ethical violation? And yes, it is. I just don't know exactly which one. Trump follows in the footsteps and he posts an image where he has a series of Goya products lined up. And when I first saw it, I thought it was Photoshop. And I definitely know that the president should not be out here endorsing stuff like a social media influencer. The beans pushed Chris Cuomo over the edge. He's on air talking about this is bullshit. I was like, is he cursing on CNN? Apparently it's happened before. People were like, oh yeah, he and Don say shit sometimes. And I was like, I've never heard it. You know what? I'm going to play it for you because everyone kept focusing on bullshit, but it was beans that sent me over the edge. I've listened to this clip like 20 times and I laugh every single time. Middle of a pandemic. Has he got time for this bullshit? Are you kidding me? His daughter, Ivanka, top White House advisor, marketing for a brand following calls for boycotts after Goya's CEO heaped praise on Trump last week. On your dime, in the middle of a pandemic, they're selling beans? Are you, are you kidding me? Seriously. Seriously. He wanted to drop the F-bomb so bad. Every time that little pause between like, are you kidding me? Beans. In the middle of a goddamn global pandemic. Selling beans. I love Chris Cuomo. I love his brother too. Speaking of which, sort of. Dr. Fauci is on the cover of InStyle magazine, which I thought was fine. Apparently he's sitting in his backyard. He's got like a, a brick enclosure. I guess you'd call it a fence. But he's got his shades on. He's got his legs crossed. He's got on a collared shirt unbuttoned. Very Obama-esque. He's giving me Obama vibes on the cover of InStyle. Some people didn't like it. Some people were like, look, the same way we're talking about Trump hawking beans in the middle of a goddamn global pandemic, then Dr. Fauci needs to be, you know, focused and not out here posing for InStyle magazine. I'll say this, and I'm biased toward Dr. Fauci. I think he's one of the few leaders that we can trust right now. 90% of the interview, and it's him and his wife, but 90% of the interview is talking about COVID-19 giving the facts, offering best practices. He goes out of his way not to throw Trump under the bus. The interviewer, which is his neighbor, also tries to get him to address where he's been. Dr. Fauci used to be a much bigger presence at the beginning of the pandemic. The pandemic is still raging on. The numbers in some places are even higher now than they were in the beginning. But Dr. Fauci hasn't been as visible as of late. It is largely suspected that the White House is blocking him from doing personal appearances, which is stupid. He is one of the, if not the best informed, most knowledgeable person about how to handle a pandemic. I mean, he dealt with HIV, what, 30 years ago? That's how long he's been at it. He's 79. He should be amplified, not silenced. So I think actually doing the cover of InStyle gives him an additional platform to get the good word out. But it was a really good interview. 90% of it is about COVID and best practices. But there's also a bit about he and his wife. She is a bioethicist, which I appreciated knowing because I was like, oh, he's not intimidated by a smart woman. They met in 1983 at NIH over the bed of a patient. She was an interpreter. She was interpreting for Dr. Fauci and the patient. And he says it was love at first sight. He asked her to come to his office later that night, and he asked her to dinner. I think that might be called sexual harassment today. But Chris, the wife, was receptive. They got married in 1985. They've been together all this time, and they have three daughters. They go on daily power walks, and they enjoy watching Chicago PD and action flicks. This interview just delighted me. I love Dr. Fauci, but we only know him as Dr. Fauci the professional, which is the way it should be. We're dealing with something very serious here. But I liked learning more about him as a person. Oh, looking at my notes. We have one last piece of very good news. Michelle Obama, aka mom, is launching a podcast. You know how I feel about Michelle Obama. I'll listen to anything 
anything that she does. Let's see what she had to say about her podcast. It's going to be on Spotify. I wonder how much they paid her for that thing. She posted on Instagram, I'm thrilled to announce a new project, the Michelle Obama podcast. It's been a tough year, and I hope this podcast can help us explore what we're going through and spark new conversations with our loved ones. I can't wait for you to listen. The first episode drops July 29th. For the first season, she's going to be talking to the people most dear to her, her mom, her brother, her friends, colleagues, and many others. Do you think she'll talk to Beyonce? Hmm. She says in each episode, we'll discuss the relationships that make us who we are. Sometimes that might be as personal as our relationship with our health and our bodies. Other times we'll be talking about the challenges and joys of being a parent or a spouse, the friendships that help us through hard times, or the growth we experience when we lean on colleagues and mentors. That sounds exciting. She says, I hope this podcast will help you open up new conversations and hard conversations with the people who matter most to you. I'm excited. I'll be tuned in. She's a rock star. I love Michelle Obama. If you have a little bit of extra time on your hands or you're willing to make time, may I make a recommendation? Skillshare. Skillshare offers creative classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions. My favorite Skillshare class right now is Creative Breakthrough, Eight Exercises to Power Your Creativity, Confidence, and Career, taught by Danielle Kreisa. I think all of us, even those who don't think of themselves as creative, have it buried inside us. This class is a great way to reboot or to get started. Skillshare offers membership with meaning. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. Explore your creativity and get two free months of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. That's two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started and join today by heading to Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. That's two free months of unlimited access to thousands of classes at Skillshare.com slash Ratchet. I'm in the middle of this big move. It's driving me nuts, but I'm trying to focus on the end result. Waking up, no alarm, natural light, and crisp white sheets. So many of my friends have Brooklyn and sheets. They swear by them. So I wanted to see what all the fuss was about. I just ordered them the other day. They haven't arrived yet. I went with the classic. They're supposed to transform your whole bed into, quote, the cool side of the pillow. I get very hot in the middle of the night, so this is perfect for me. If you're not familiar with Brooklinen, they were founded in early 2014 by a husband and wife duo. They wanted to find beautiful home essentials that didn't cost an arm and a leg. They have a variety of sheets, colors, patterns, and materials for all your lounging needs. Now, I went with the classic, but there's also luxe sateen, linen, and heathered cashmere. Brooklinen sheets are the perfect place to start making your mornings great. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their bedding comes with a lifetime warranty. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code RATCHET only at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. Speaking of people that I love, I mentioned him earlier, John Murray. John Murray is a Washington, D.C.-based American TV commentator, pop culture expert, media personality, and social media influencer. He has appeared on cable news channels such as CNN, HLN, and MSNBC. When I used to do these shows when I was still in D.C., I would always run into John in the green room. I know him as my dear friend who always looks out for me. He calls my mom the queen, and he's my behind-the-scenes conversations. The conversations that I can't have in public about industry matters, I have them with him. He knows my thoughts on everything. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome John Murray to Ratchet and Respectable. I really think uh, Skype has the best ring music. That whole interest music is just so dope. It is. I love it. It gives me joy. It's the little things in life. The little things. Can you hear my neighbor's music? It's like blaring right now. Can you hear it? Is it like distracting? 
I can't hear your neighbor's music at all. So I know it drives you crazy, but I can't hear it. Okay. Because like it, the bass is like literally vibrating my body right now. And usually I would reschedule, but I have to finish packing my apartment. Because of the neighbor's music. Well, yes, that's why I'm moving is because the neighbors on both sides <laughs> are... Give me the total update that you was like gone, gone. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. Like today is, is trap music from the young white neighbor from Tennessee. I think the, the family of four with the producer husband, I think they're out of town. I haven't heard him in two days. And, and to think trap music used to be that thing you once desired. It's the ratchet in your ratchet and respectable. So I like trap music. Don't get me wrong. I just don't want to listen to it for hours on end from someone <laughs> else's apartment. Oh, yeah. You got to love it. <sighs> or leave it, which I'm or about to do. It. I have to thank you as well, because like I, you know, I'm packing up this apartment by myself and you've been keeping me up to date by sending me all like the pop culture news. So thank you. Listen, it's a lot going on in the world. Monday of this week, I was overloaded with headlines. Like, I'm just like, okay, one more story, one more headline comes out. I'm going to have to go lay down or pour a drink or something. It was just like, everybody's lost their mind. The world is imploding. Well, the thing you hit me about yesterday was the, the not the view, the real. Tamara's oh, leaving the real. real. What's going on over there? Like, I mean, I know like Amanda left, but I didn't see any of the other ladies leaving. They got an Emmy together. Like, what's happening? They just finished six seasons, but they, they, you know, there's a whole year leading up to that. Okay. So it's seven years in total. Amanda needs to be on a forum that's about social justice and activism. Daytime talk doesn't necessarily yield itself to the amount of about it, about itness that Amanda likes to have. So I, 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 I'm sure time and uh, and creativity and all this stuff will yield her a platform where she can be the totality of herself. And, you know, I've seen her stand up comedy where she uh, is very effective in, in using her social activism, civil rights stuff, her feminism and all of that stuff and bringing it to the table and even making it humorous. Um, so there, there are platforms and things that work for her. Now, with the Tamara scenario aspect of it, getting back to what you know originally asked me, none of the hosts there are currently under contract. You know, on TV, there's cycles. You go in and out of contract. So all of the hosts there were currently, uh, to my understanding, renegotiating their deals. And apparently, Tamara was trying to negotiate some things that just didn't gel well with the network. And so she just decided to bet on herself. Uh, it was a good run. Uh, and now it's time for me to go in and do other things. But the truth of the matter is that it happens all the time in this business. The view is the 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 best scenario of it. I mean, mm. they've had more co-hosts than the law should allow. And uh, <laughs> and 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 you know, troubleshooting aside, they have now grown and become what New the New York Times calls the most powerful political show on television. Um, and the talk has had cast changes. Destiny's Child has had cast changes. The Supremes, New Edition, The Temptations. <laughs> Hello, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So cast changes happen in this business. If you grew up like I did with a mother who watched soap operas, at any given moment you would hear, and the role of such and such is now played by. Cast changes have been a part of the entertainment industry. I think in the social media society, everybody's very like, oh my God, what's happened? But folks move on, and the show's typically, you know, with the refreshing gets a little better. I would love to see who they're going to... Um who they're going to replace her with. Or we shouldn't say replace. I would say who they're going to add to the lineup. I'd like to see you go in for a meeting. You think so? I think I think you have an amazing connection with women in your format. I think you're so well-versed. You have a definitive opinion, which is so necessary in talk TV. And you can talk about everything from uh, Chris Brown uh, and men and gray sweatpants. Uh, <laughs> But then, you know, you, you come from a political family and you could talk politics. You could talk women's issues. You're a feminist. You know, you've done work with Planned Parenthood. And so I think somebody like you is well versed. But I'd like to see them maybe add a, a, a bold face name and a fresh face. So maybe like a, a like a, a funny girl, like a Kim Whitley. Uh, you know, who's a mom and then add someone like you who's single and still figuring it out and has a completely different perspective than everybody else on the show. Or go with a bold face name like a Michelle Williams from Destiny's Child. And there's a, a, a really great TV host and red carpet host out in L.A. who I just think is in need of a big break named Jasmine Simpkins. So I'd like to see them mix it up. Friend, can we talk about Chance the Rapper? Oh, poor Chance. I know him as, as an outspoken guy. I know him being like social activist. I know him as being Christian. I know him as being a dope rapper. 
I mean, I know like Kanye kind of like put him on. And so maybe that's why he decided just sort of out of the blue to endorse Kanye for president, even though Kanye ain't really running. Like that's all a marketing ploy for whatever he's working on now or he just needs attention or as press reports say, he's having an, an episode, allegedly. And not just any press reports. Now, TMZ, People Magazine, Us Weekly, all the people that the Kardashians pick up and call directly. So when when we see outlets like that talking about he is having a manic episode as a, as a, as a result of his severe bipolar condition, and admittedly, you know, he has confessed publicly. We've all seen that epic TMZ rant of an interview where he talked about being off his meds. And so, like, even before we dive into the chance part of it, it it upsets me that I, that mainstream legitimate media continues to give a platform to this man operating in what I personally believe, and I didn't go to uh, medical school, is insanity. They bring a legitimacy to these episodes, and I think because at the beginning of his career when he was acting out and doing things, people just thought he was in irreverent and they thought he was edgy and they thought he was just being a bully. But the truth is a lot of these characteristics have existed all along. I do believe when his mom was alive, she probably helped him manage his bipolar disorder a lot better. And at one point, even uh, you'll remember his best friend the pro and producing partner, Rhyme Fest, mm. got upset with him. Because Kanye had been off his meds so much that he was acting out so much that Rhymefest went public and said, um, I can no longer support him, be friends with him, or work with him creatively until he gets back on his meds because it's, it's too much for me to watch. And I think at, at the time, Kim Kardashian lashed out at him and said, you're just mad because he won't finance your charity or something like that. But the truth is the man is not well, and I think people should frame his antics through the lens of, of that truth. The fact that this man announced that he's running for president and it got legitimate mainstream media coverage, you had to get down to paragraph five, six, and seven to see that he hasn't even filled out the paperwork yeah. and that in most states he's not even eligible to be on the ballot. But you've created this hoopla around a person who is having a manic episode. I don't know what it'll take for people to realize that things are as serious as it is. Like, I'm hoping that this doesn't go the way of other people who have been mentally ill, other artists and things, and they have these tragic endings. And then all of a sudden, it's like this level of empathy or compassion. Like, oh, he really wasn't well. No, he wasn't well when you guys were using him for clickbait. And starting a choir and singing about Jesus does not eradicate your mental health issue. Nope. And it does not give you an excuse to be able to say egregious things about the history and the culture of black Americans, about African Americans and your own ancestors like that, even in your ins insanity, that's offensive. And yeah. so we've got to stop giving him a pass and making all these other like Kanye West is not the way that he is because his mother died. Kanye West is the way that he is because he has a mental disorder that needs to be treated. Can we talk about do I want to talk about Terry Crews again? Terry Crews is one of the nicest men I've <gasps> ever met in Hollywood. Is he? And much as I, oh my God, one of the nicest and genuinely kind men. I, if I'm not mistaken, I did one of his first mainstream interviews when he was coming off of this show called Battle Dome and he had just started acting. Uh, someone I was friends with at the time was his publicist and asked me to do it. And I actually had watched Battle Dome. So I was very familiar with Terry Crews and the character he played on the show. Um, um, I think it was, yeah, Battle Dome. But as much as I like him, as nice as he is and as entertaining as he can be, I want him to shut the hell up. How can you be such a wonderfully nice person in real life and then be such like a douche, essentially, on the Internet? I think we live in a climate where everybody wants to be profound. But he keeps saying his version of profound and then he gets these clapbacks and then he gets all in his feelings and defensive. It's very much like the Tyrese effect. People, I think, like Terry Crews before he started tweeting or being on social media. And now everyone pretty much hates him. Chance was, you know, failing because of this endorsement for Kanye. Like he's trending. He's getting roasted left and right. And then Terry Crews jumps in and, and Chance is like, you know what? I may be taking the wrong stance because if Terry Crews agrees with me, like... I'm not going to die on this hill. I think I'm going to roll back down. He actually tweeted something of that nature. As much as I like Terry Crews, I'm really going to dread the fact when one day he might have to write a book that says how I ruined a stellar career with a series of tweets. Yeah. He and Tyrese. I've never seen two people who desperately, willfully don't want their audience. And again, we have to acknowledge with Tyrese uh, and 
someone who I used to be exceptionally close to. Uh, no beef. We still get along. We just kind of grew apart. Like it happens in life. We learned after the episode that he had where he was crying and stuff. And then he was in court shortly thereafter with his uh, first wife that there's also a mental situation there as well. And sometimes these displays aren't necessarily rooted in anything other than you're, you're, you're not having a good day in your mind. As far as Terry Crews is concerned, I don't know that there are any challenges there other than as a bad parallel, we've all met that really pretty person who just wants to be considered smart. And so you have this guy who's really talented. He's, he's really he's beefy. Got a physique. I think sharing his Me Too journey put him in this place where he felt like maybe he was this profound activist thought leader and it just isn't working out too well. Minimally, to, to put it lightly. Right. Part of the reason I wanted you to come on the show, or I asked you to come on the show today, was because most of the time we have a very common ground about how we think about things. Like we'll, we'll differ slightly, we might have different reasons, but we're usually on the same side. On this Jada and Will, and August Alcina, because it's not just Jada and Will anymore, it's Jada, Will, and August Alcina. You hit me up, because I didn't even know the red table was up, I knew it was coming, but you hit me up and you were like, apologize, apologize. Because I thought he was lying. I really did. I thought he was making some shit up to, to, to do some album sales. Just because a man says he slept with a woman, to me, that doesn't mean he actually did. So I was like, well, let's see. Like, let's wait and see. I was like, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. I don't know why we're all rushing to believe him. But as it would turn out, I was wrong. And I do need to offer him an apology because I thought he was full of shit. Well, he wasn't. He was, he was full in Jada. Oh, oh, sir. Sir. Did you watch The Red Table? So here's the thing. You and I have a really loving, playful brother and sister type relationship. We really have a good time. And we've been toying around with the idea of doing something weekly on Instagram. We, we still need to revisit that because I think it would be really cool for people to see us have our yin and yang, Mars and Venus dynamic. But the truth of the matter is, I know there are all these versions of what people think about both the, the, the Jada and August Alcina entanglement. And then there's also people who have a view of the Will and Jada relationship. There are people who believe they're in this open relationship. They both live these double lives and all this other stuff. This is what I believe to be true based on my own understanding. And I, I do have a couple of um, friends who are very closely acquainted with this couple. So I, I feel like I have an informed understanding. I believe that these are two people who were madly in love when they were introduced by Tisha Campbell and Dwayne Martin. When Jada was coming out of a bad breakup, Will uh, was coming out of his divorce, which he's talked about was the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to him. I think they were madly in love. You know, I think very much early on in their relationship, they had a, a traditional relationship. But Will has been very forthright about him determining early on he never wanted to experience a divorce again. And so there was nothing that she could do or he could do that would cause them to completely uh, disband the relationship. The divorce was not an option, was the term that they used. Um, and that gave them, uh, that opened them up for a lot of fodder and an innuendo and people started saying they were in open marriage and stuff like this. What I do believe is that like a lot of couples, not just black couples per se, I think they've been together a long time and at various points in a relationship sometimes you grow out of love with a person. And in our culture, particularly in America, we see the divorce rate is very, very high. Typically, when people get to a point where they, the love is gone, people are on to what's next. Sometimes, and we know, particularly, uh, I can speak from a black family perspective because I've seen this, you see couples that grow apart and the husband and wife start living in separate bedrooms and they still show up to the family gatherings and stuff together and they ain't gonna go through a divorce or anything, but both of them might be stepping out a little bit because they're kind of coexisting and living separate lives. And I genuinely believe that's the place that Will and Jada had kind of evolved to, that they went from being madly in love and had these kids, and, and they became two people who loved each other, but started coexisting on two different paths. I get the idea that you're in this progressive relationship, and this is a partnership, and we love each other, and we're not getting a divorce, no matter who dates within the confines of the marriage. But here is my real concern with this thing. And, and I'm, you know, I can, you can make jokes about, you know, entanglement. I've been doing an entanglement uh, thread in my Insta stories on Instagram at John Murray, J-A-W-N-M-U-R-R-A-Y. 
follow me. But I've been doing the whole entanglement thing, finding these sexy black couple photos and, and, and the best R&B slow jams and adding into it and all of that. But the truth is, after watching Red Table Talk, I was a little concerned because August Alcina was a young man in his early 20s that was introduced as a family friend, meaning that he probably came in via the kids or whatever. And Jada went from playing a mother role, helping him to get healthy, to calling him daddy in bed. I think if this was a conversation about a man who was in their mid-40s doing this to a young woman who was like 21, I think the energy would be different because we'd be looking at the man as a pseudo-predator. I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that this thing went from I'm nurturing someone who's my son's age to nurturing an orgasm. Sir... Two things. One, I think that the idea of a man in his mid 40s or older being with a young woman in her early to mid 20s, it's normalized. So I don't think if this if the shoe was on the other foot and it was Will stepped out with some woman who was in her early 20s, I don't think people would say he was a predator at all. I think the onus would have gone on to I was intentional not to call her a predator. I said it just made me uncomfortable. uncomfortable. So I'll talk about that in a second. I think when men do these sorts of things that it's very much so normalized and if we're going to say that these types of relationships are inappropriate then say they're also inappropriate for men as well. I don't like the use of the word predator. People have been throwing that around but I absolutely do agree that this was inappropriate and for several reasons. One of them being like you said that they were in like a, a helper healer sort of scenario. Also because you know it's a friend of your kids you bring your friend around and then your mom eventually starts sleeping with them like that's kind of icky i do very much wonder how the children are handling all of this mess but i just i don't know i feel like people are really running jada through the ringer so many celebrity men have been caught out there you know break babies and cheating on videos in the whole nine yards and we we're holding women to an entirely different standard and I'm not saying lower the standard to where men is. I'm saying if we're going to hold people super accountable, then make sure we're doing it to people. Make sure that we're not just holding women accountable and then we don't do the same for men. I do not disagree with anything that you said. And this is the only factor that makes this a little different for me. I do believe that in our society, uh, the old head man with the young starlet girl you know, the, the little Barbie on his arm is something that has been celebrated. However, I genuinely believe that if this was an interview with some 20 something year old, a uh, young R&B singer, oh, Summer Walker, somebody who's talked about having anxiety and some mental issues of her own. If, if you watch this, a very uncomfortable interview where Summer Walker talked about how she was broken and dealing with all these life challenges and some mental challenges and stuff like this and that Will played a daddy figure and then the next thing you know they were embroiled in this relationship um, I do think once you factor in the whole mental health aspect of the scenario people would be just as uncomfortable if the, if the roles were reversed and this was a story about Will now, if this was just a story about Will dating some young model, I don't think it would be an issue at all because that is the standard in the society. And I'm never going to pretend like there isn't a double standard. I mean, in 2016, we saw that Bill Clinton could have very well went back to the White House, but Monica Lewinsky is still called his hoe. So there's certainly a double standard in our society. My real challenge outside of this, it made me uncomfortable and it's a little alarming that you went into a mothering, mentoring, healing relationship. And then the next thing you were in a long standing relationship with a young boy who you completely turned out. And that's the part about that makes me a little uneasy. If you want to date within your marriage, then you should probably find somebody that's just functioning on a different plane. Well, I think one of the things that people keep overlooking in this conversation too, is that Jada was also in a broken place. I think it's more of a he was there. He was present. She was working with him. She and Will started going through whatever issues they were having. It gets so bad that Will is to the point, like he said in Red Table, he was like, I was done with you. Being separated from your husband, I guess at the time for about like 19 or 20 years, I think that's where they're putting the timeline at. They're about 25 now. Going through that separation, being on the brink of divorce with someone you've been with, you know, almost half your life, like that's major. That puts you in a really messed up place. That's very devastating on all levels. 
Jada also talked about unhealed childhood trauma. She talked about other traumas that she had in her life, other ways that she was unhealed. So I think you've got a situation where although Jada is older, she's also still broken. So I think that that's probably why I don't think that it was, to use the word that other people have been using, exploitative, as some people make it out to be, why I don't advance it beyond clearly inappropriate, like definitely give it that. And people talking about August's pain, they're also not talking, they're not acknowledging Jada's. They're just sort of painting her into this predatory cougar. What's the woman from, from Boomerang? Marcus! They're putting her in that sort of stereotype without lo- sort of looking at what she was going through as well. And I think it matters. What you just said really makes a lot of sense. If you believe that is the true dynamic of the relationship of Will and Jada. I personally don't believe that they were in this broken place and and that he was about to be through with her and all this because as he has said definitively throughout the years and even in some interviews around this time when they were supposed to be broken, divorce was never an option for the two of them. Bad marriage for life. I mean, but I said divorce was never an option when I got married. And I was like, divorce, like, under three years later. You think it's not an option until you're in a situation where you're just like, fuck this shit. I can't do this no more. Sometimes you make your way back. Sometimes you don't. Again, I think at the beginning of this segment, I said that some of my insight on this dynamic may be a little more... um, I may have a little more inside trading as it pertains to some of the inner workings there. Okay. And I'll just say that While Red Table Talk was interesting and compelling to watch, I don't think that all the description of what was going on emotionally behind the scenes are necessarily in line with the reality of what was going on. Will and Jada have gone through several rumors about their marriage, about different people being involved in their marriage, about separation or brink of divorce in their marriage. And they've always either completely not addressed it or given it like a one liner and that's it. So for them to sit down for, I mean, all of 12 minute segment. Shortest red table talk they've ever done, by the way. Shortest red table talk, but also the most that they've ever really addressed the rumors or stories or facts, as a case would be here, about their marriage. It was very uncomfortable for me to watch because I felt like it was something I shouldn't be privy to. One of the things I've learned and privately, you know, that celebrities often lean on me for counseling and direction and things like that. And I've had to call a few male and female celebrities and challenge them on uh, some of their dating practices and some of their extramarital affairs. And one of the things that I I would tell anybody, celebrity or real life person, is if you decide you want to do something that's outside of your norm or you decide you want to date or you want to step out of your marriage or anything, you should be doing something with somebody that's at least on your level. If you're going to be with somebody... They're also 50% of that relationship. So if you choose to be in a relationship like that, you should make sure you're with somebody who's never going to share their experience. And the reason why I believe that he's entitled to share his experience, because it is a story that was compelling from the aspect of this man fell madly in love with a woman who started mothering him. Who was also married. And he says her husband said, it's cool because we're not together right now. Do you think he said that? Do I think he said it? Yeah. I'll say this. August's truth is what got us this real table talk, right? They ain't never talked about anything else going on there and, and, and as it pertains to this part of their life before August told the truth, right? They even came out and said that their, their publicists that put out those statements didn't do that with their permission. We didn't give them those statements because they, they, uh, they had to walk back the fact that their reps lied on their behalf. All I'm going to say is in this story so far, the only person telling the truth is August Alcina. And yeah. Will had to hold Jada accountable when she called this thing an entanglement. entanglement. Yeah. He said relationship. He didn't call it his wife's affair. Do you think he looked like he'd been crying or drinking? I just think he didn't get groomed. But when we do TV, you know, you put a little powder on. There's a squad that comes in and gets you together. And I just think he was like, no, nah, I'll do this old natural. Okay. I'm going to sit here and play male Barbara Walters. I, I thought his eyes looked a little bloodshot. And that could be from 50 million reasons. He might not have had a lot of sleep. If there was an international news story about the state of my marriage, actually there has been international news stories about the state of my marriage. It's a very difficult time. Maybe there's some sleepless nights. I would imagine that this has been very uncomfortable for the Smiths to manage. They just probably would have never wanted to talk about this. For obvious reason. Because it's complicated. 
I mean, and yes, it is. It's a private affair. Everybody is free to do whatever they want to do within the confines of your marriage. If you are a a spiritual person, then you know that the Bible says that marriage is undefiled. If you choose to do something that makes your marriage work, which is like dating and you know having fun and whatever within the confines of your marriage, if that works for you, then it works. It doesn't work for public consumption, particularly as people of color. We're very traditional about relationships. And, and black people in general, I believe, are a lot more conservative than we, uh, than we let on. It's hard for people to understand that two people might be in a, in a progressive, open-minded relationship. And while I do not unequivocally believe that they are swingers or all this other stuff that people are saying, I do believe that these are two people who love each other, but they just are not may not be in love in a traditional sense. And that maybe both of them, at their own admission, have had relationships within their relationships. Yeah. I also think, like, uh, I would say maybe... I want to say more so than the average couple. I think sometimes people forget because Will and Jada, I mean, they are very A-list, but I think sometimes people, we think of them as like very down to earth and family. These people got a whole lot of money and a whole lot to lose if they go their separate ways. Um, yeah. Separately, they're okay, but together they're an empire. They're, they've got some very invested reasons other than, you know, like family and kids and love and uh, quote unquote sanctity of marriage. But there are like, you know, several millions of reasons that they may want to like keep this relationship working i agree i agree and listen the 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 great thing about the conversation you and i are having is that there's no judgment here there's no ridicule we're talking about our emotional response to what has been shared with us i share with you privately that out of everybody i've met in this business and it's so funny i said the same thing about terry cruz a few minutes ago but at the top of the at the totem pole for me will smith is the nicest guy i've ever met in my life I interviewed him for one of his movies, uh, and then we stood in front of a hotel and had a conversation about hair dye and being premature gray. And then a few months later, I was at Essence Black Women in Hollywood talking to Gail Mitchell, the editor of Billboard, and all of a sudden she goes, Will Smith is on his way over here. Will Smith is coming here. And I turned around and Will Smith was like, hey, man, I saw you across the room, and I just wanted to come speak. And now this time, he was the biggest grossing box office star in the world. Just amazing, warm, friendly, talk to you like you're the only person in the room. He's a great human being. So there's no judgment here. I've had interactions with Jada. She's been very nice to me. I don't know her or haven't had the uh, extended pleasantries with her that I've had with Will. But I say all that to say that, you know, it's hard living a real life in a, in, on the Hollywood stage. And everybody has to make choices that allow them to necessarily not necessarily be in scandals and so i wish we weren't having to talk about any of this but you know this is a result of making a choice to be in a relationship or an entanglement with somebody who you this wasn't the one you should have chosen we haven't heard about any of the other ones you've been with but you were misguided in selecting this one for many reasons for many reasons agreed all right my friend I think that's it. I think we've covered everything, everything big this week. Also, look me up. I'm John Murray, J-A-W-N-M-U-R-A-Y on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube. And then on Facebook, I'm John Murray World. So just add world to the end. And John is not a a made-up Hollywood name. My dad was J-O-H-N. My mom didn't want me to be a junior. And J-A-W-N was her compromise. So I've I've known you forever, and I didn't know that was the backstory for your name. Yeah. You learn something new every day. Listen, I love your show, Demetra. Keep doing great work. I love your audience. You've grown this thing, and people are responding to it, and I'm proud of you. So just keep shining, my friend. Oh, thank you, friend. And thank you again for keeping me up to date. Like, I, that's a true mark of friendship. Like, you know I'm busy, and you make sure that I'm in the mix so I can keep my show popping for another week. I appreciate you. Uh, all right. All right, my love. Thank you again. All right. Have a good one. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Don't you love John? Oh, he's the best. Love him. Thanks again, John, for doing Ratchet and Respectable. And thank you for tuning in for another episode. I know you don't have to. I appreciate that you do. Next week, we will be back on our regular schedule. The next episode drops on Thursday. If you need some Ratchet and Respectable in your life, I'm not posting as much as usual because I'm trying to get this loft together. And I got to find rugs for this audio. But 
You can follow me on social media at Demetria L. Lucas. That's on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I think that's everything. Yeah? Okay. Talk soon. Bye.